Great. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. Um, I'd like to go ahead and point out that we've got some guests joining us today from a medical alumni affairs who are co-hosting this event. With us tonight are Dr. Butch Fowler, Super Tar Heel himself, class of 1966, and our Associate Dean for Alumni Affairs. We're also joined by Kathy Harris, Director of Medical Alumni Affairs, and Todd Dawson, who together provide indispensable support um, for our alumni, and you all know and love them well. Also with me tonight are the rest of my medical education and alumni development team, Kirsten Beatty, Megan Hunt, Mary Elizabeth Entwistle, and Samantha South, who have helped to put this event together tonight. So thanks to all of them. But the stars of the show tonight are our um, administrators and students. So um, I'd like to first of all introduce Dr. Lisa Rahandale and Dr. Beat Stein who are with us tonight. Um, as you all know, medical school is very different than it used to be. So we're excited um, to be able to talk about uh, what a day in the life of medical school students look like and how that's, how that's shaping up, as well as some updates from our school and areas across our School of Medicine. Um, Bad, I'll start with you, a proud UNC alum and Senior Associate Dean for Medical Student Education. In this role, Bayot works closely with teams in student and curricular affairs, financial aid and scholarships, and across the school, really, to create an exceptional learning experience for all of our students. He is trained in family medicine and brings that sense of personal care to his leadership, and we're very grateful for everything that he does. Lisa Rahandale is also an alumna of our medical school and our associate dean for admissions, so she's very, very popular, but especially this time of year. She has the huge task and privilege of identifying about 190-ish medical students who will thrive here at Carolina for the next four or five years out of more than 6,000 applications annually, so do the math on that, and you know what the odds are these days. Despite this tremendous responsibility, Lisa maintains a really busy clinical and research practice as an OBGYN. So Lisa, we're so grateful to you and the time that you put into making our school what it is. So what I'd love now, um, Bayat and Lisa, if you would both give a couple of minutes of updates on your areas across the school so that our alumni who are present can hear a little bit more about that. And then we will introduce our students and begin our panel. That sounds great. Thanks so much for having me. And it's nice to see some alumni here on the call. And what I would do, anyone who's listening to this on the recording and has questions and follow-up, please email me or get in touch with the alumni office and then get through to me. So I don't wanna take away very much time from the student's presentation, but briefly give you three updates and one overarching kind of commitment. I'll start with overarching commitment. I, it's so important in my role, all of us as educators and colleagues, this commitment to social justice in our curriculum. And we do this because of the grave health inequities that continue to exist in our country. And I'm firmly convinced when we better teach social justice to our students, we start to narrow those health inequities. And we have done this in a really successful way across developing new pathway programs. One you may hear more about is Carolina Excel. We're changing the curriculum to make it more inclusive teach better about some of the history that's important for students to learn about race and racism so they understand how to address social justice. We're really heavily focusing on faculty development. That's super important, all of which creates a more inclusive learning environment where our students can thrive and develop the skills they need to for those areas. So that's the overarching commitment. I think the three updates actually kind of relate to that. We just rock the LCME site visit. The LCME is the accreditation body that is a tough, tough organization these days. There are schools, really good schools that go on probation. We, with the help of many faculty, but also with the help of many students, just did such a nice job. We had really like less than 10 minor citations. They won't come back for another eight years, which is just very nice to hear. So that's one update and it's an important update. We also did really well on the match. So Andres, congratulations. He'll probably talk a little bit more. So he's gone past the process, but we had over 96% match rate, which means essentially all of our students match well above the national average. And we were a little bit worried in COVID would somehow the match rate drop and it did not because this is such an amazing place. And then related to that, the last final update, we made it through year COVID. You know, March this year, or March last year, we really thought we would have to pause medical education, maybe three months, maybe six months. We went right back to it. We improvised. We made a more creative curriculum and everyone stayed on track almost. 
So the graduating class, class of 21, is graduating on time. Application phase, completed application phase. Foundation phase, stayed on track. And this is our, even starting to do more in-person stuff. So I'm just so proud of our school. And that's my quick update. Thank you, Bayat. Um, it's been it's, it's such a it's such an honor to get to have gone to this school and then get to see how, um, you know, despite the fact that it's so many years later, all the same values and um, important emphasis on our state and um, excellence is, are still present at our school. So from a you know from an admissions perspective, in terms of um, updates, you know, every year we are so honored to get so many excellent applicants and applications, and we didn't know what would happen this year. And uh, we still, you know, we had over 6,500 applications and actually had an increase in the number of applications, about 10% increase um, in applications from the state of North Carolina. And these were excellent applicants. We've had a really um, great pool of um, applicants to choose from to get to our class of 190, which includes the MD program and the MD PhD program. One of the um, exciting but um, you know challenging things we had this year was to figure out how we were going to interview our applicants. We interviewed um, almost 700 students um, or applicants for the spots, and we had to change that to virtual. And some of you who've uh, been to updates before, I've talked about how we've changed our interview days where it's not just the one-on-one -on -one interview, but we do um, activities where we work as groups and we um, ask different types of questions to elicit um, more, um, more information about interpersonal skills and things like that. And so we had to kind of flip all of that and put that into a Zoom format. And I think it worked. Um, you know, I, everybody by the time we started interviewing had become familiar with Zoom, and um, and we were creative, and we had a lot of students who helped us. Some of the I know Andres, you are um, you did a lot of interviews for us, and um, we did it. And so you know now we are at the stage where um, we've filled a class, but of course still have um, a wait list that we're considering. And um, you know, one thing that's really important for us to build this class is the support that we get from alumni and others for scholarships. They really make a difference to be able to recruit really competitive students to our school and maintain you know, the excellence and the sort of spirit that we have at our school um, with students who have multiple choices and um, also for students who, um, you know, need financial support to be able to uh, break barriers and um, bring um, diversity to our school so that we can serve the state. So that's my update. Should I go ahead and introduce our first panel member? That'd be great. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. So our first panel member is Samuel Rains. Um, he is in the class of 2024, so MS1. Sam is from Chapel Hill originally and attended UNC for undergraduate and fell in love with the university. Uh, the kindness, intelligence, and dedication of the people at the UNC School of Medicine are what lead him here. He is currently on the executive board of the UNC Student National Medical Association, volunteers with SHAC at UNC, and also serves on the UNC HIV Care Community Advisory Board which is a community board that helps facilitate communication between the HIV infected community um, and researchers at UNC. And um, he is one of our Blanchard scholars. Should we do all of the introductions first and then go on? Yes, yeah, you wanna that, do the next? That, that, well, that'd be great. Why don't you, you wanna just continue and then I'll, I'll frame the questions. Oh, okay, great. Great, I get to do this fun job. Okay, so um, next I'd like to introduce Alexis Flynn. Um, she is a second year um, here at UNC class of 2023 and a Shirley and Colin Thomas and, um, Loyalty Fund Scholar. Um, Alexis is a, um, well actually, so you know, she's an MS2 but has started her application phase. Is that right, Alexis? Yeah, so she has, she is from Fayetteville and she attended UNC as an undergraduate and has served the School of Medicine as co-vice president of curriculum affairs of the foundation phase in UNC student government. She is the uh, Dymock College advocate and Association of Women's Surgeons president and a Paul Godley Art of Medicine fellow and 
is in the incoming application phase. Um, she is a curriculum officer at the Asheville campus. So it'll be neat to hear about um, your start in Asheville. And then um, Casey, um, Casey Rybart is in the class of 2022 and is a um, WL and Carolyn London Loyalty Fund Scholar. And so Casey's originally from Ohio, but calls North Carolina home. She attended UNC for undergrad as well. Um, she here is a pediatric medical student chief, is on the Pediatric Hematology Oncology Patient and Family Advisory Council, serves as a mentor and engages in research She's a loyalty fund scholar and a member of the John B. Graham Student Research Society, and she assists with our recruitment efforts. So thank you, Casey. And then um, Andres, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, but um, because you are a Thomas Crowell loyalty fund scholar um, and will be graduating with us and just finished the match. So I'm gonna let you share your own news yourself. Thank you. Um, yeah, hey everyone. My name is Andres Lopez. I'm from Hendersonville, North Carolina, which is the mountains. Um, and got to do my third year in Nashville as well. After five years of teaching in inner city Memphis, I decided to come back to Carolina and my goal was to serve uh, marginalized ethnic communities in the state, making UNC the perfect and my dream school. So I was ecstatic when I was accepted. Um, during my time here at UNC, I've been an MED program teaching assistant, uh, president of the Latino Medical Student Association, and also inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society, which was a big honor. And I just recently completed capstone projects for my compost longitudinal medical Spanish curriculum, as well as a uh, medical education scholar concentration. And I found out last week that I have matched to stay here another three years with the family medicine residency um, in the rural track. So super excited to be here and continue working at Carolina and moving the mission forward as well. Well, you know, that's a beautiful transition. And maybe the way to do it, Andres, if you don't mind just continuing, because that's really the voice of the students is so important. So having you talk a little bit what it's like to be a senior student, like what were the most joyful moments of being a, um, a senior student? And then we'll just work our way down. We'll go to Casey, Alexis, then to Sam. And that will be sort of the formal introduction. And we'll do a, form, a few more kind of formal stylized questions, but also, other folks, alumni on the um, call, as you have questions, please interrupt this conversation and ask those questions too. So Andres, to you. There's been a lot of actually really awesome parts of uh, this fourth year of medical school. I think one of them actually was really early on and that was my acting internship. I know those can sometimes be really challenging, really tough, long hours. Uh, but I think as someone was mentioning earlier in the lobby, that really jump in responsibility, that jump in ownership and that growth you see during those months is tremendous. And I think for me personally, especially working here at UNC, where there is a lot of autonomy, there is high expectations for you. It made me feel like that jump from fourth year of med school to residency isn't as far as I need to be. And I'm as I think it is. And I'm much closer to it um, than I thought I was. And I think that was a really cool insight to have in fourth year. One of my favorite things. The other aspect was definitely getting the individ individualization of individualization phase. The, the curriculum and the, the course book is so extensive. There are so many different things to choose, especially me being someone who wants to do family medicine. I felt like almost anything was applicable. One of my most favorite ones was actually the rural focus point of care ultrasound rotation, where I started literally from just completely baseline of nothing. And then by the end, um, I was actually getting to teach all the MS ones like here's how we do a cardiac ultrasound and here's how we do a personal long, a personal short. Here's why we're looking at mitral valve excursion. What is that a proxy for? And it was so cool. And that's something I'm so excited to take with me for residency. But I really think that if it wasn't for the efforts of a lot of the administrators and some of the people here, that that wouldn't have been an opportunity that I had. And I even got to get a handheld butterfly ultrasound to take home with me and scan myself and my wife and my friends as test subjects at home. Um, and then the last thing is being able to already give back, um, one, to my patients, because I actually have the ability to do so. I have enough knowledge. Two, to the school by like teaching other medical students, MS1's ultrasound and stuff like that, and also chatting with them about branch campuses and sort. And then I think the last one is also giving back to the undergraduate community. I try to pick up a lot of mentees that I know are like, you know, maybe from marginalized communities and trying to uh, get into a medical school but just really talking to them about my journey and also helping them understand what their journey may look like and that it's different and that every journey is different has been 
awesome part of fourth year. Um, it's never too late to make an impact. It's never too early to make an impact, I guess. Yeah. Andres, that is so inspirational to listen to. I'm sure there were bad days, but it's just cool to hear how much you learned and enjoyed. So thank you for sharing that. Casey, maybe let's go backwards through the curriculum and you've experienced application phase only recently and just starting in the visualization phase. So maybe just your highlights. Yeah, so this has been a whirlwind of a year. I think third year is, um, you know, it's it's pretty grueling. It's it's tough. I'm sure our alumni remember. Um, I'm sure other people on the call who have been through it, they they can resonate with this. But it's it's so much information. It's so fast, and the hours are long. But it's so rewarding to actually leave the classroom. And I think there were times where I felt like I could really make an impact. I could really make a difference. And and I was actually talking with people. So I wasn't just reading the books. I wasn't just talking in my head. I was actually getting to say these things out loud and and getting to to be a part of people's stories, which was the main reason why I came to medical school is that, you know, everyone's kind of living their own movie, living their own story behind the scenes. And now I get to kind of have a step in. And that was really, really very cool. Um, and I think going through application phase, I, I just felt like I, I got a lot of I received a lot of tools for my future career. So I do want to be a pediatrician, but even rotating through surgery, rotating through ob seeing all of the different aspects of medicine to be able to better care for my patients in the future was so wonderful. And, and hearing the talks about individualization phase and how now I can kind of hone in on the classes that I think, wow, I'm really eager to start doing this. It, it's making me really excited. Um, and one just really high highlight for me is, you know, having just started individualization phase just this month, um, I'm starting on a service that also has first day, third year medical students. So first day, third year, like application phase students. Um, and so I certainly am not an expert by any means whatsoever, but it's really cool to see um, the progress that I've made and to have them come to me and say, how do I structure a presentation? How do I, you know, write this note? And I've found ways to be helpful on our team in, in different ways with just being kind of a, a mentor and supporter for other students, which has been so fulfilling. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about all of this and I'm excited to continue through individualization phase and, and have more of that kind of dynamic tailored learning. But I think application phase and, and going through all the core clerkships was just invaluable. And I was just so pleased and so excited to work with a, just a an amazing number of excellent educators and attendings and residents. I there was no there was no shortage of people who wanted to teach and wanted to be involved. And I just learned so much. And I think you asked about things that that bring us joy. And I think just being around people who I felt were just so invested in me and wanted me to do well was so fulfilling and and being able to continue mentorship both inside the hospital with other students and also outside the hospital too and students who are interested in coming to medical school and and seeing how far i've come in this journey has been just incredibly fulfilling um and i i think just hearing about the match hearing about all the things that are coming i i am just so grateful for the the experiences and education i've had thus far to be able to continue doing things that i'm interested in and, and giving back to other people as well so whirlwind answer but just a whirlwind year of third year um and i'm just so grateful casey i love that image of stepping into a story as that's what application is phases about stepping into patient stories you're exactly right so that's really cool so Alexis, you're just sort of on the other part of that clinical entry. You've had some clinical experiences, but then COVID sort of made things a little bit more difficult. What were the highlights of your last year? Um, there's so many. Um, I would say that, you know, when COVID first started happening, um, I think we all anticipated that we'd be able to go back to school by like um, the end of the school year. So as I slowly realized that we weren't gonna do things like um, like a skit night or a college cup. It was like, oh, I don't know if I have anything to look forward to, but it was, it was kind of beautiful seeing, um, um, because of the various leadership positions I have, seeing uh, faculty, staff, and um, just a lot of different members of UNC work collectively to modify our curriculum and to, the planning, to be honest, was one of the most beautiful things I've seen. Legit, I, I, I love logistics. So seeing people behind the scenes work so hard to make sure that we would have some sense of normalcy in our curriculum was, you know, inspirational. Um, that, that was one of the biggest highlights of seeing um, like administrative um, 
work. But generally speaking, um, Zoom Classroom is not as exciting as I hoped it would be. Um, but being able to still like go through various blocks and, you know, understand the curriculum was really, um, really exciting. And then also um, we would have times where like over the summer we would have um, Dr. Kernick would um, do like various like MSK and um, GI dissections, which was really helpful. And we actually got a chance to see like the anatomy lab, um, but also just um, being able to like spend time with uh, students was also really nice. Um, but yeah, but um, as I transition into like this curriculum and uh, application phase, um, we started about three weeks ago, but it's kind of like uh, Casey said, um, seeing like intersecting with people's stories is, is really beautiful. This is um, going from didactic learning to clinical learning um, is a steep learning curve. And um, <laughs> I'm one of those people that are asking like, how do I formulate this HMP or how do I explain this? Or wait, so I need to adapt this family medicine um, sort of presentation style to like just about every other um, specialty. Um, but being able to really put into effect the didactic learning that we've um, experienced is pretty amazing. And one of the things that I, you know, with the transition to um, online learning or like virtual learning was, will I be able to be as well equipped as I would have been if it would have been in person? And there's been various incidences, even in like the first few couple of weeks where there are still those clinical pearls that I learned in didactics that are come shining through or remembering like, well, remember when Dr. Kernick said this, or I remember when um, Dr. Rose Jones said that thing about cardia. So, there's, the, there's those moments that really resonate and, um, you know, make that didactic learning, despite how it, we received it, really worthwhile. Um, and, you know, if, it feels like I'm somebody's doctor a lot of times, and, it, and it's an amazing feeling. Uh, and, you know, this is what we've been looking forward to for the past what, 27 years, and um, experiencing in real time is, is fantastic. Um, but yeah. So, yeah. You know, it's so great to hear you talk about going through the curriculum, but also being able to take a step back and sort of seeing the structure behind the curriculum. And certainly, Lexis, you've been one of these students who really contributed in significant ways. So I'm also really grateful for that. So thank you. So Sam, I am gonna pose that question to you with a little bit more hesitation. Are there joys? It's been such a hard year. You've barely gotten to know anyone else. Um, right? Because you, your class started really when it was already all in lockdown. So hopefully there were some things that are inspirational. I would say definitely. Um, this year has been very interesting in a lot of ways, but uh, I think a lot of the fears that I had coming in with knowing COVID would be, would be there have been sort of taken care of by like what Alexis was saying, like all of the, the faculty and administrators are just so invested in our education. Um, and it, it's really been just I feel so cared for and I think all of the other students do too um, that everybody is always reaching out to us um, and it, it's been very helpful I think in a time where a lot of people feel alone um, but it, it feels like the school is just right there with you um, going along um, I've definitely just been despite zoom class it's been so incredible getting to learn all these different things that it's very like learning how to adapt to the, the curriculum each month sort of learning a, do, a different organ system every different month um, is very different than anything I've done in the past. Um, but it's been so exciting getting to start to feel like learning how to think like a doctor um, and just really getting a taste into all of these different um, organ systems and specialties. Um, I would say my favorite class that I have right now is PCC, like learning how to do, like make a differential um, and actually getting to have some some practice in doing the physical exam and stuff. I know I'm very early on, but it's been super exciting to, to get to see all of that. Um, but I would say this, it's been a joyful year in general, um, despite COVID, I would say. Um, I'm, I'm certainly, the, one of the main reasons I wanted to come to UNC um, for undergrad and medical school is just the, the social environment and the people um, and, Everybody is just so caring here. And I would say this year really has embodied that. Sam, I must say it warms my heart to feel that support because we really are all so worried 
that we're not offering enough support. And so we've really made very conscious efforts and it's nice to hear. So thank you for that. And I'm gonna pause for a moment before passing the next question on to Dr. Rahangdali and see if Dr. Mencher, Dr. South or Dr. Pringle have any questions kind of related to what you just heard. I'd like to ask Casey when she decided to become a pediatrician. When, so what time did I decide? Yeah, what no. time in your education or pre-education, medical education? Yeah, so I, I was always interested in working with the family unit as a whole, um, but I didn't know if that would be an ob gyn or women's health or anything like that. Um, and I had saved my pediatric clerkship for the end of my application phase with fingers crossed that I liked it as much as I thought I would. Um, and so I went into it just being well prepared, having gone through a, a, almost a full year of third year, learning how to present, learning how to care for patients so I could really come in and immerse myself in that experience. Um, and right before my peds clerkship, I actually did um, a month long, my psych rotation was in child and adolescent psych. So I got to really just care for kids who were, you know, well physically, but not mentally. And so I could have conversations with them and get to know that patient population. And then the following month I did inpatient general peds. And so now I kind of understood how to interact and have conversations with kids and now how to treat the physical problems that they're going through as well. And I think that was so fulfilling and I felt so well prepared for that because of my other rotations. And I still had in the back of my mind that I might be interested in doing med peds um, and caring for adults as well in some capacity. But after starting my acting internship this month at WakeMed in Raleigh and being pretty you know, autonomous for a small patient census of kids with just really general like pediatric hospitalist problems, I was quickly realized this is where I needed to be. And I thought the breadth of medicine was so phenomenal. The parents, you know, it's a scary time. And I think it's rightfully a scary time for these parents. And I think if, if you can go in and calm a scared family, that's a skill set that you need to use and a skill set that, that would serve everyone around you um, to, to share. And I think I quickly started trying to, still currently doing it, obviously, but to develop that skill set and realized really quickly how rewarding it was. Um, so I would say sometime in, in the past month or so, I really said, this is it, this is for me. And I felt having the preparation and autonomy leading up to this point and then being able to be really prepared to start caring for my own patients that I was already thought I might be interested in just completely tipped it over the edge. So now I'm all in. I just had a meeting with one of my mentors today and he's like, I love your energy. I love the excitement for this, but I am so ready and I'm, I'm getting very excited for the next steps. That's such a great answer. Great, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Mentor, any questions that you have for any of the students? I thought this was going to be, even without COVID, a very difficult year because Berryhill wasn't there and there wasn't a home for medical education. But I guess with COVID, nobody would notice that you don't have a physical place to go. But I, I don't know whether that was just fortuitous and allowed things to go more smoothly or whether that was an additional loss. I wonder if anybody could, who, perhaps not our first year student who didn't experience Berry Hill, but those who know what I'm talking about, you know, is this just an additional loss or did you not notice so much because there was too much else going on? I could talk about it. Um, love Berry Hill. I don't know why, just kind of, the, the, the building for me was where me and my, my classmates studied a lot, even after school. So for me, I have some pretty good sentimental memories there. And then that's where, my PCC was, so literally Dr. Martini, who I met on day one of med school, and then who saw me in my acting internship three years later do a large volume pairs and thesis, like that's where I met her. And that's where I started my whole journey of being a doctor. Um, but I'll be honest, just fourth year for me was so busy and I was between so many different campuses, so many different clinics that I don't think I would have had time to go to Berry Hill at all this year, <laughs> realistically, right? Um, the only bummer for me is I didn't get to do it this year, but this year, they started having fourth year med students help tutor in uh, PCC, the doctoring class. And that would have been in Berry Hill. And that would have been a sweet whole lap around where I started in Berry Hill. And then I'm teaching people in Berry Hill. I didn't get it, but that's okay. You know, I, there will be uh, opportunities hopefully for me in the future in the new and improved Berry Hill. You know, Darlene, thank you for asking that question. It's funny, in my little quick updates, 
I didn't even mention the loss of Berry Hill because I think it's sort of, we've been able to navigate it. And we are super excited to have the new building. And I think it's worth saying a new building, hopefully in the winter, fall of 22, that's coming right up. And my office actually overlooks the construct construction site. So, and Samantha, I think I inadvertently awarded you a doctor, but if you would like to ask a question, please feel free to. And otherwise I'll turn it to Lisa. Okay, well, um, so I'm going to ask you, so for some of you admission happened just recently and some of you it's been quite some time. And I was just um, curious if you could share, you know, what are some of the things that you did um, prior to um, medical school that um, you um, thought were really useful or things that you now, once you count to medical school, you would say, hey, you know, if I was advising an applicant, I would suggest that um, they think about this or that. Um, I can answer because I think I'm probably the closest of anyone to applying. Um, so I took a gap year after um, college and continued doing HIV research that I had done during undergraduate. Um, and I think something that I would recommend is just take your time. You know, it's not a rush. You don't have to immediately apply out of school um, or out of college. I mean, a lot of people do, but a lot of people don't. And being non-traditional or taking a gap year or a few is, is totally okay. Um, and I think for me personally, maybe not everybody, but it, it helped me, I think, strengthen my application and just wrap my head around um, what I wanted to do and what my goals were. Um, so I think... That was probably um, a good piece of advice if you're not necessarily if you're like on the fence or something, but if you're just trying to get your application all together really quickly or something that might not be the best um, goal. So just be patient and take your time um, would be my advice. Yeah, and yeah. if I can add to that. Oh. oh, I said thank you. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so I was. Uh, like a non-traditional applicant. Um, I, had t I, I graduated like in 2015 and then I like actually matriculated into medical school in like 2019. So I did a, um, some, some wet lab research at the EPA. I did a master's degree at NC State. Um, but one of the things that I also got to do was live my life and enjoy my youth and travel and, uh, you know, save, save explore the world. Um, and I think that's really important that you do a good amount of self-discovery before you make such a strong commitment to anything. Um, I knew that when I was pursuing medicine that this was for me and I exhausted any other option that I might have questioned so that I knew that this would be the experience and like the path in life that I would want to take. And that's something that I would always advise because you never want to get to a point where you regret or you question the decisions that you make and however long that takes you is how long it takes you. Um, also, I would say that, um, yeah, I think that's it. Great. And I think um, building off the, the self-discovery aspect, I think that was wonderful. Um, I think one thing that I do a lot of, I really enjoy mentorship and I work with people all the way from elementary school to current graduates looking to apply to medical school. And one thing that I feel like I found myself saying to people lately is just, to really take your time and learn from the people around you and whatever you do. And so I worked for several years before coming to medical school, um, but whether you're working or you're researching or you're in school, you can learn something from every interaction you have and every person you meet. And you can kind of hone the way you talk to people, hone the way you interact with things, hone your situational awareness. And I think being able to do that makes you so much stronger in medical school. And I think uh, especially in my third year, I, I noticed quickly that the best clinicians were the ones who could just relate to people and who were quick on their feet to adapt and to read the room. And I really think in no matter what you're doing, especially with a lot of medical schools doing these um, <clears throat> but uh, MMI interviews where you're put in kind of these different team building situations or teamwork situations. And, and I've kind of been on the other end of evaluating those for the School of Medicine as well. And some of the best applicants are the people that move me are the ones who are kind to everyone around them, who know how to engage a team, who know how to connect 
with one another. And it's really great if you have all A's and you have perfect test scores and everything else, but I really think your patients are going to care the most if you know how to just talk to them and that your team is going to love having you. They're going to give you more responsibility. They're going to trust you if they feel like they can communicate with you. And so no matter what you're doing prior to medical school, even if it's fresh out of college or you've been working for 10 years, finding ways to hone, like we were talking about that self-discovery, but also the way that you operate and the way that you speak and relate to people, um, I think is just so important. And I'm sure anyone who's interviewed um, can tell that it's very, you can, it, in a very short amount of time, you can tell someone's situational awareness and how much they, they kind of connect to the world and, and the way they see things. And I think taking the time to develop that, it just makes you such a stronger applicant and makes you way more relatable and exciting to those that you talk to. As someone who uh, was a teacher for five years before med school and also interviewed a lot of applicants this year, I wouldn't add on to anything anyone else said. I echo all their sentiments. Thank you. I think that, you know, there's a lot of um, concern about how we're going to, you, you know, how people are going to uh, prepare for medical school with uh, the last year, with, you know, the restrictions with COVID and things like that. But I think that what we're finding is that, you know, it's, um, applicants are entrepreneurial, they're creative, and if they have that true desire to serve and to um, be with people, they're finding ways. It's really neat. So thanks, everyone. That's really great. And, you know, those comments make me think of kind of a related transition or a related question. So you transition to med school, and Andres has already transitioned to the next phase. As you heard about our wonderful match results, as you hear Andres say, look, I'm so excited. Does that make the rest of you more nervous, more excited? How does that make Alexis, Sam, Casey feel? I am out of my mind excited. I will say I will start this off with a strong high excitement. I was just like, so seeing the match PowerPoint, watching the videos, watching everything, seeing familiar faces, it made me really think about the programs I might be going to or potentially staying at UNC, which would also be phenomenal. And I think just thinking about those things and saying like, that's gonna be me with my slide on the PowerPoint of my dogs and pictures <laughs> and me doing fun things. And I am just so thrilled. So congratulations on matching. I think that's wonderful. Um, and it's, it has paved the way for others behind you to be so excited as well. Yeah, I definitely echo uh, Casey's sentiments. One, congratulations, uh, Andres. But also, um, Match Day, generally speaking, is like a holiday, for, like one of my favorite holidays next to like Christmas and my birthday. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I think it's like a beautiful culmination of all your hard work. And I mean, before I even apply to UNC, I, you, of course, you look at the match rates, you look at uh, like where people are matching and um, are they out of state? Are they in state? Like what kind of special subspecialties or specialties are they going into? Um, and I mean, going into this, I had no doubt that the class of 2021 were going to match well. And um, it's just beautiful to see that everyone's hard work is, is paying off and um, they're becoming physicians. So it makes me excited about the future. I feel exactly the same. Um... I'm super excited. It feels really far off, but I know it'll be there just before I know it. Um, but I certainly, I feel less anxious. Um, I was looking at the match list and everything um, and just about everybody ended up, I feel like to, in an amazing program um, in such a diverse group of specialties um, and places across the country. Um, so it sort of just gave me more confidence that if I keep working hard, I'll get there someday. Um, so it made me excited. You know, Sam, I'm glad you mentioned that. So it's worth saying for whoever listens in currently or listens to the recording, students did this really neat thing. They matched at 31 states across the country in really competitive programs, but also 40% of students stayed in North Carolina to serve North Carolinians. And I think that dual, you know, that's kind of the dual mission of our UNC School of Medicine. So we can go all over the country but we also have a really strong commitment to the citizens of North Carolina, so. I gotta jump in here for just a little bit is that uh, I'm the old man here. I, I started uh, in this wonderful medical school in 1962. Uh, so I've been around a while, but uh, I think that uh, 
just listen to the students and something that has been true since I got here in 1962 is the devotion to education. Uh, and education is what it's all about. And uh, though there's new ways to educate and, and new toys and this, that, and the other, uh, it, it, it is a commitment to education. And everybody talks about how uh, their, their professors and everybody has looked after them and has been available. Uh, and the other thing uh, is that I have watched where our students go over a number of years. And I always say, you're the pick of the litter. Uh, everybody wants UNC graduates because they know what they're doing. They know how to look after uh, patients. And uh, not only that, they're good people. Uh, and, and that's the number one thing is have a good person. If you got a good person, uh, everything else will fall into place. And I think that uh, uh, our, our admissions process here uh, has, needs to be congratulated about uh, how we do pick the right people. Dr. Fowler, that's such a beautiful statement. And I love the emphasis on good people because I think, I mean, Casey, you said it, like perfect scores only get you so far. But it's really understanding people, talking to people. That's what gets you really, really far. So love that. You know, I'm sort of wondering, um, those were some kind of just general questions. I wonder if anyone on the call, I mean, it doesn't have to be just an alumni, um, anyone on the call has questions for students that was prompted by this discussion um, or just by questions that you have in the back of your mind. I'll jump in. Um, this is Kirsten Beattie from UNC Health Foundation. When we're out and meeting with alumni, I feel like um, sometimes alumni understand how our curriculum has changed and sometimes they don't. Um, so I'm wondering if y'all could speak to kind of the difference between even 10 years ago, what was that MS1234 process and now what it looks like to have these three phases of education and kind of some of the, the benefits of moving to that curriculum and how that shift has gone for the medical school. Kirsten, I think it's a great question, and I'll focus it a little bit more narrowly, but then have Lisa and I contribute more broadly. So Andres, you've been kind of in this curriculum for a while, and you've also been really involved in admissions this year, so you kind of know what's going on at the beginning. Any observations of, are we changing the right direction, or what's what do you see is moving in the right direction? I see, it. so one thing I'll say about the UNC School of Medicine that I was very surprised of, and I, I probably should have looked at this when I was applying to medical schools, but I was so heart set on, on my mission of serving North Carolina, um, is that y'all really listen to feedback and y'all actually will change stuff as a result of the feedback from students, right? So I know my year, for example, is the first year that like the tests were changed and it was focused on like uh, tests that yes, were based on the curriculum and based on what we need to know for the awards, but also took into account what was on our standardized tests. Right. In addition, now first years have all ultrasound training, which to me is an incredible thing that's going on. Um, and then in addition to that, for example, I went to Asheville campus and I know already they've made so many changes there. The class size has grown immensely. They have preceptors both in Andersonville, Asheville and rural locations. They've tried to tinker around with the amount of time you're on inpatient, outpatient. And then that campus in itself is a great example of innovation because they do a longitudinal style curriculum where all your inpatient is front loaded. And then after that, you get spiraling outpatient preceptors that you get to build strong relationships with. And then also almost your own continuity panel during that time. Um, and so just kind of those things alone are already things that I've seen change while I've been here. But I really think that's all a result of administration hearing the students out, what they think needs to happen, and also responding to the changing landscape of medical education in general whether step one is now pass or fail, and now it's pass fail, right? Um, and things of the sort. So I, I, I have seen a lot of change. It's been awesome to see, but I really attribute that more so to y'all being willing, able to, to hear and also to make those changes. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. We strive, we strive to listen carefully, but also not to put the burden on students, right? Because in essence, you're here paying tuition. We need to be educate you as physicians, but, love to hear your feedback, love to hear your contributions. And maybe ask the question also to Alexis, you've been really involved in student government and I think you've been a really important contributor. 
were involved at LCME site visit, so have some insights. Any thoughts on how to Kirsten's question? So in terms of the um, the transition or like the the progression innovation that I see in like UNC curriculum, I would say that um, I see it on like a a basic level because like one of the things I did with like being a um, the, one of the VPs of curriculum affairs is continually meeting with um, faculty members at the end of the block as well as in real time um, in the middle of the block to just discuss student feedback as Andreas was saying um, and seeing the modification of the way that um, information is presented. Um, additionally, in terms of um, some like team burst, team based learning, for example, um, the emphasis in the beginning of my um, first year of medical school um, versus like my second year was very different. Um, and the use of um, yeah, team-based learning. And then also um, 145 is another thing that I've seen innovation in, in terms of the way that feedback is disseminated to students, which I think has been very effective. Um, one of the things I've seen uh, because of the progression from um, in-person to virtual learning is that at one time um, we would, for example, have um, like, after a test, we would be able to see the answers um, during an exam review and ask um, faculty members um, about the questions that we gotten wrong. However, because of um, like privacy and things like that, um, that need to be modified in a new way so that um, we could keep the, the secrecy of those exams um, and seeing faculty members um, like take their time to have Zoom meetings to discuss questions with students was also really important to us, but also on 145, um, seeing um, questions, not directly, how I, I feel like I'm not saying this correctly. Um, they can't show us the answers essentially, but they can explain the thought process and the clinical reasoning behind those answers and um, making sure that we get the content and the understanding of formulating clinical reasoning was always the emphasis of faculty and seeing them adapt that into this new um, virtual learning environment was really important. And also them hearing us regularly and listening to that feedback and modifying the way that we, we receive that information was also really important to make sure that we were getting the same quality of education that we would have gotten if we had not, if we had been still in person, which I think is really important. And then um, like with LCME reaccreditation, seeing like the work of like Dr. Steiner and Joanna and um, like Jane and Jana was also really, really amazing. But yeah, there's just so many moving pieces at UNC, I would say. Um, and um, seeing the, the hard work that all of our faculty and admin put into it is um, one of the things that I like just take great pride in at Carolina, to be honest. Um, you, like every move they make, I can see that they, their strong passion in, in education and learning and just, just um, you know, creating the next workforce. So, um, so that's nice. That's so cool. Thank you for that, Alexis. Um, Dr. Hongdali, you've been here for a long time. And um, what, like, what do you tell people who are admitted about the changes, sort of responding to Kirsten's question? Well, you know, um, many times the, um, the applicants or the admitted students, they're kind of overwhelmed by all of the detail because they're just excited about being in medical school. But, um, you know, I think that the, the highlights of the curriculum are that the um, time spent in the classroom um, is mixed with, of course, time doing clinical work, as well as um, the fact that they get to be done with it in 18 months, as opposed to a full two years. So the reason why they are coming to medical school gets to be experienced um, a lot earlier. So I think that that's one of the highlights that people really like. And then I think that there are different things like the scholarly concentrations that are very attractive to students where um, there are different areas. If you're interested in education, if you're interested in um, ultrasound, for example, or um, technology, basically, um, and uh, different sort of focuses that you might want to have during your education, that there's space for that individualization of your medical education. And you know, the one thing I would add also, so several of you, Alexis and Andres, both were at a regional campus in Asheville. 
So that was our first campus now quite a few years ago. And the way we've expanded to the regional campuses is really exciting. And I think it again, it speaks to the power of our state to educate students across the state. So we now have regional campuses in Asheville. We have regional campuses in um, Wilmington. We lost a regional campus in Charlotte, but then regained a regional campus in Charlotte in going from Atrium to Novant, which is really excited that we now have kind of campuses in the central area, which includes Raleigh and Greensboro, in Wilmington, in Asheville, and then again in Charlotte. And I think that just makes, I think, this education also really special for students. So I think that would be another part of my answer to your question, Kirsten. You know, we're getting close to wrapping up. I know that Janine had a couple of closing remarks that she wanted to give. Um, so can I pass it back to her? Absolutely. Thank you, Bea. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everyone, for serving on the panel and for being here today. Samantha, if you'll bring up our slide one more time, I did just want to call your attention to a couple of other events that we have coming up between um, now and the end of April, so over the next month. For anyone who has um, a graduation year ending in a one or a six for medical school, of course, you have a milestone reunion coming up, so you can visit the MAA website anytime and find out more information on that. But regardless of your graduation year, we encourage all of our alumni to join us on Friday, April 9th for what I've learned in medical school, which is a fun every year um, tradition that we have where students compete in the speech competition and we have alumni service judges. It's always a good time. We are able to do it this year, even virtually, so we're excited to have that. So hope you will all join us and, and log in for that. Registration again is on the MAA website. And then also our Medical Alumni Council meeting, which are open meetings to everyone, regardless of whether or not you serve on the council. But want to say a special thank you to our, our alumni who do serve in that way, but welcome everyone to join for that meeting. Um, and hear from school leadership on latest updates, COVID. Really excited to have Dr. Matt Ewan present the keynote address at that meeting. So hope that you can uh, join us for that as well, Thursday, April 15th. And that is a little bit later in the evening. Wanna call your attention to the 7 p.m. start time. That is of course, to allow for our alumni across the country in different time zones to participate after work hours. Um, I believe that, that that one will also be recorded, but certainly what I've learned in medical school will be recorded. So please check the Alumni Affairs website often um, for new updates and for registration links to each of these things. So again, a final thank you for joining us. Really excited to have had this opportunity and please do share this link um, once it's up with friends and others in your classes so that we can share the latest updates from your School of Medicine. Thank you everyone and good night.